Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Assessing the Student Experience, Student Affairs Learning Outcomes. In this webinar, we will explore why it is important to measure the skills students are developing in co-curricular activities and how different institutions are developing and assessing their learning outcomes. My name is Alexandra McFarland. I am a researcher at the Higher Education Quality Council of Ontario, otherwise known as HECO, and I will be the moderator for today's event. As I go over some housekeeping items and introduce today's panelists, please take a moment to fill out the poll on the right-hand side of the screen. This will help our presenters better understand who you are. So a few things before we begin. If you have any questions for the panelists or are experiencing any technical difficulties, you can send us a note in the Q&A on the bottom right-hand side of the screen. When you do this, please keep the send defaulted to all panelists so that everyone can see your question. So you may be wondering who is in this webinar with you, and it may appear like you're the only one, but I assure you this is not the case. Um, we have over 100 people with us today. Um, so thanks for everyone for joining us. So the plan for today is that we are going to hear from three different panelists for about 10 minutes each, and then we'll have some time for some questions at the end of this webinar. So if you have any questions, um, your chance to send them to the panelists is in the Q&A section. We'd like to answer everyone's questions, but considering the large size of our group today, we would like to apologize in advance if we do not get to your question. For those of you who cannot stay with us for the full hour, or for your colleagues that were unable to join us, you will be able to find this webinar posted on our website at www.heco.ca shortly following today's session. So without further delay, it's my pleasure to welcome today's presenters. With us, we have Dr. Kara Wakecamp, who serves as the Manager of the Office of Intercultural Affairs in Student Life at the University of Guelph. We also have Mr. Adam Kuhn, who is the Director of Student and Campus Community Development at the University of Toronto, and Dr. Sonia DeLuca Fernandez, who is the Director of Research and Assessment for the Division of Student Affairs at New York University. So if you've not already done so, please answer the two poll questions on the right-hand side of the screen. Um, the poll will be closing in approximately um, 10 seconds, and Kara will, will go over this poll. So um, at this time, I'd like to welcome Kara. Ani, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm honored to be able to share with you all today. Um, to place in context, I think, my contribution, um, I, the um, chair of my departmental assessment committee, and at Guelph, uh, the Department of Student Life it, uh, resides within the Division of Student Affairs and is composed of a few units, the Center for New Students, Community Engagement and Global Citizenship, Off-Campus Living, and the Office of Intercultural Affairs. Um, and for our context, the assessment committee is made up of individuals from our, that are from across all of those units. Um, so in preparation today, I think the facilitators, we all reflected a bit on um, what the student affairs as a profession um, is, and some words that came to mind for me are included on the slide. I think that oftentimes um, when we are talking across our institutions or sometimes um, outside of our institution, there's a view of student affairs professionals as um, the people that are helping students navigate their way through our institutions and supporting them personally. Um, people often think of housing, um, athletics, uh, different units um, that are helping students succeed in the classroom. And while parts of that are true, I, I believe we're all educators ourselves and we're working to foster environments um, and opportunities where students can learn outside of the classroom <clears throat> and integrate their classroom learning with volunteer and paraprofessional roles. I think it's through those roles um, and experiences that student affairs professionals help students in demonstrating and articulating the knowledges, behaviors, and skills that are needed to be successful in postgraduate and grad, um, postgraduate work and the labor market. For us at Guelph, um, 
we're guided by our student affairs mission, developing the person, the scholar, and the citizen. If you want to take a second to look at the poll results, um, it looks that many of the people on the, on the call today are responsible within their role for assessment, so 79% of us. Um, and there's a range of the uh, personal experience is also noted there. Um, so in student life, our vision is to be partners in learning. That's um, what I was sort of indicating. And our department in its current configuration um, is somewhat young. And while there are a number of assessment activities going on on those individual uh, unit levels, including things like personalized learning and development plans, some pre and post assessment activities, and of course, a number of surveys. There was no harmonization um, in the process or results of the initiative. However, there was an understanding that a coordinated assessment approach would be helpful to reinforce what it is that we offer, what's the value added in um, what we offer students, and to help us measure the impacts on student learning and development that we are having outside of the classroom. But we weren't starting from scratch. So in 2010, um, our divisional outcomes were released. That had cross-divisional um, input, and that resulted in five learning outcomes. In 2012, there were institutional outcomes uh, released. They had a very strong academic focus. And um, there were another five uh, learning outcomes. So we started this work in around um, 2013 with our outcomes being um, established in 2014. So they're quite new. Um, and it was cross-departmental work. Each unit had the freedom to um, map their own outcomes and or any outcomes that they were using previously from other sources. All team members were included in the process, including directors, managers, coordinators, right to our admin staff, and then at the unit level, uh, students. So the, each unit established inventories of their core programs. And um, key to all of these processes, I think what is really important in assessment is that we had the support of our director, who's prioritized assessment. Um, she helped provide us with a vision. She included um, the resources needed to do this, including um, people and the time and the platforms to help us make it happen. Um, naturally, there are a number of promising practices that we were revisiting in the literature that we drew from. And I think some of those are like AACNU, the Association of American Colleges and Universities, Learning Reconsidered, Learning Reconsidered Two. CAS standards, um, the University of Pittsburgh, the outside of the classroom curriculum, and support from campus labs because um, on our campus they're utilized through baseline and collegiate link. So to give an example of what that looks like on the ground um, and what our colleagues were asked to do in the inventory process, I'm going to start sort of in the 9 to 12 o'clock um, area. We asked them to link their core programs to the divisional outcomes, and we also um, asked them to include any other outcomes they were using from another source. We asked them to, to then also describe the purpose of the assessment, and some people's assessment was being linked to reporting needs or any collaborative initiatives they were doing. Um, if there were specific populations that they were working with, in our case, um, we highly work uh, with diverse students, first gen, Aboriginal, first year, international, and off campus, just to name a few. Um, and finally, we asked them what their current assessment methods were. And as some might expect, the most popular assessment methods were surveys. Um, there was also a lot of one on one observational work happening and personal reflection. There were also tons of evaluative processes, so, satisfaction surveys were overly abundant. Um, the process allowed individual units the freedom and autonomy to self-identify their core programs, and it was important that there was collaboration and learning throughout the process rather than a real prescriptive strategy coming from the committee. So that resulted in 
um, eight learning domains, which I've included on this uh, slide. Each has a set of learning outcomes. We actually have 44 outcomes in total, so we have quite a few outcomes. And provided with those are um, each domain has a preamble that is um, the context, sort of giving all of the overall goals of the domain um, and the learning outcomes. And because students have always been at the forefront of the work, the language is, has been really important in how we are promoting this to them. Um, the images for the badges are also very Guelph-focused. Um, I know a few people are surprised when they see our communication bag badges at Canon, and that may seem strange, but if you've ever experienced our campus and know that our, our Canon is painted nightly by the students, the relevance is clear that it is a, a message board on our campus. This, um, some of the mapping it was um, an interesting process. So you have 44 learning outcomes and you set people free to decide what are the outcomes that they feel are linked to their program. And we did see a little bit in, of overexcitement in that first round, um, particularly for units where people weren't yet using learning outcomes. There was a little bit of loss in focus in being intentional, which is really easy to do. We all know that anecdotally our programs might do this or that. Um, so we had witnessed some of the power and potential of indirect learning in our programs, but we weren't necessarily measuring it. So we went back and did a second round where we really guided staff to look at what are we intentionally teaching and training and selecting the outcomes that we can measure and assess. The next step for the assessment team was to develop rubrics for the learning outcomes. Uh, so this is just one example um, from those. The rubric, rubrics are a direct measure for assessment, and, um, but they require the student to have the true opportunity to display their knowledge, behaviors, um, or skills so that they can be measured. Um, overall, they can help communicate the expectations for students, but I also think help communicate um, to staff the different levels that their programming might take part in um, providing for students. They help allow for consistency across our units. Um, they also provide feedback from student learning and uh, programmatic feedback. And so through all of that, they're helping us refine our practice and enhance student learning. It also was a really time-consuming process. Um, so we were fortunate to have the opportunity to, we met probably weekly for uh, months in a row as we um, worked on those rubrics. So what did that really look like on the ground, kind of as an overall? Um, checking out the literature and the promising practices, talking to a lot of different people. I found a lot of uh, people who were already ahead of us um, were really willing to share, which was important to the way that we did our work. Um, it helped us look for efficiencies in how we were doing things. We really needed to engage staff and keep them engaged in the process. So we continued to make sure that assessment was a priority with that, uh, within the year and made sure that there was a section in all of our departmental meetings that we talked about assessment. It wasn't always work. It could be someone providing a highlight from um, assessment results that they had um, completed. And we um, then started to have and put together some toolkits for staff beyond the rubrics. Um, and we continue to further develop those as we're working. We're intending this to share our, our promising practices with the wider community, both institutionally and with colleagues at other institutions, with our funders. What does it look like for students? Um, we use, uh, like I mentioned, Collegiate Link. So at Guelph, that's called Grist Life. And it, we're fortunate to have um, a platform that allows us to both promote events and um, track student learning um, and that allows them to access the results of some of that learning. 
um, they we've put together a team of staff and peer helpers that help students um, navigate the different programs and opportunities that are available on campus. We're finding students have fatigue about all of the different offerings that are there. So this helps them navigate the way, um, the different learning that they want to um, explore and spend their time a little more wisely to reach their goal. So we've really just completed a year of launching some of this work and we've had um, great um, response from both students, but we've also had great response from other uh, departments within student affairs and more recently even some of the academic programs who are looking at um, the co-curricular within their programs engaging with some of the work we're doing. So it's really exciting to see people on campus um, engaging in the work beyond just within our own department. The uh, assessment committee is working strongly on an assessment handbook. Um, whether that will actually be book-based or more a web tool that our community can continue to use to support themselves between um, opportunities for learning um, that we have to finalize. And then the thing that we've recently started, which is exciting, is we're looking at core assessment questions. So for this first stage, we're looking at core assessment questions for each learning domain, um, not each learning outcome. And um, it should be an exciting year as we start to really work on those and um, re-engage some students in the work that we're doing. So I'm going to leave it there. Um, like I said, I think it was really valuable to get um, to be able to reach out to people. So I would be really happy to have people reach out to me. If there's anything that I shared today that you're interested in learning more about, I'm happy to share and can be contacted anytime. Thank you. All right, thanks, Kara. Um, thank you so much for sharing your information about the amazing things that are taking place at the University of Guelph. Um, my name is Adam Kewen, and I am the Director of Student and Campus Community Development at the University of Toronto. My area consists of three main teams, club and leadership development, mentorship and peer programs, and lastly, orientation, transition, and engagement. I also have responsibility for providing divisional leadership in the area of assessment, along with our newly hired manager of assessment and analysis, Jeff Burrow. So to understand a little bit about our context in terms of student life and student affairs, U of T is quite large and decentralized. So while today I'll be speaking about the work we're doing in the central division of student life, there's also a ton of great work being done with regards to learning outcomes and assessment in the various faculties, residences, campuses, and undergraduate colleges. So in our discussion today, I thought it'd be useful to start big and broad and then slowly zoom into some specifics about how we are thinking about learning outcomes and assessment here in the division of student life. So I thought I would start with a quote and I found, I was digging through some old caucus monographs and I found this one from 1988 written by William Stewart. And I thought it would be a great place to start. So in order for us to become more influential contributors to the development of students on our campuses, we need to work toward the development of an appropriate vision of our work. This vision and the ways in which we implement it must maximize our support of the academic process, clarify a co-curricular role relative to the whole student experience, bring the student support services together and explain our role to the campus community. I thought this would be interesting to highlight um, because what Stuart was saying in 1988 is still uh, very much true today. In student affairs, we are consistently reflecting on how we can meaningfully contribute to the whole student experience and this is just, true, uh, just as true today as it was then. Assessment efforts are a great way to bring clarity to our role as educators, both to ourselves as well as to students and other campus stakeholders. And true as it was in 1988, it is vitally important to showcase the value of student life units to the entire campus, as well as improve programs and program offerings in order to maximize the level of support and engagement for students on our campuses. Whenever I speak about assessment, I draw upon a story that I find useful in explaining the importance of learning outcomes in assessment. It involves um, a target, which is why I chose this beautiful Jasper Johns painting. A man is walking by a barn and notices a 10-year-old kid throwing darts at targets painted on the side of the barn. He looks more closely and notices that out of the 20 or so darts the kid has thrown, the kid has hit the target every time. Not only is he hitting the target, but he has gotten a bullseye with every throw. 
The man approaches the kid and says, that is so incredible. You are so talented. How is it possible that you're able to hit the bullseye every single time? The kid says, it's easy, sir. First I throw the dart, and then I walk up right after and draw and paint the circle around it. Uh, I like this story because it speaks how often we look at assessment. We run a program, we run an initiative, um, an intervention, a service, or an activity, and, uh, and then afterwards we conduct some assessment and then draw the circle around what we've accomplished and say that it was successful. The story is helpful because it helps us realize that another way to do it would be to throw the, uh, draw the target first. This can look at like a learning outcome, a participant rate, or any kind of goal that you have related to your service or activity. When we deliver the service or program, we are then throwing the dart. The act of assessing the program then lets us know how close we got to the bullseye. And if we are slightly off, the data can help us course correct for future programs and understand how we can improve. Here in our division, we use lots of strategies to assess our learning outcomes, and Kara mentioned several that they're also using at the University of Guelph. We have an abundance of surveys that we're conducting, um, and Kara also mentioned some of the great work that they're doing with rubrics at Guelph. One of the things that seems to be also quite popular is the idea of pre- and post-tests. So administering the same instrument in advance of an activity and then doing it again at the end and then being able to track the difference between um, the pre-activity responses and the post-activity responses. I had an interesting experience with this at a previous institution where we were using um, a socially just leadership inventory in order to do a pre- and post-test with regards to a leadership certificate. What we observed is that students actually in the post-test were ranking themselves at scores that were much lower than where they were at the start of the activity. So we had a bit of a, a bit of a freak out because we were nervous that our leadership certificate was, was having a negative effect. So in order to assess this further, we conducted some informal focus groups as a way of kind of member checking and bringing the data back to the students who had participated. What they showed us was that, in fact, prior to participating in the certificate, they were very confident that they were socially just, that they were collaborative, that they understood equity, diversity, and inclusion. And through the process of going through the leadership certificate, they had a more um, in-depth knowledge and awareness. And so at the post-test, they had a little bit more, they used the word humility around these topics and therefore um, ranked themselves a little bit harder. So in fact, when we were able to do a bit of a mixed methods with a pre and a post and a member check kind of focus group, we were able to see that in fact our certificate was having the results that we were hoping. Um, a strategy that we have been using um, to assess kind of a multi-component program is kind of our uh, approach to mapping learning outcomes. So, if you have a workshop or a one-off event, sometimes you can map out several learning outcomes and then design your assessment strategy to, to take a look at if you are or aren't kind of meeting those outcomes or to what degree you are meeting those outcomes. But then it can become quite complicated when you're looking at multi-component programs. So I'm thinking of perhaps some student leader training programs, um, alternative reading week or service learning, um, anything where students are gonna be having multi, multiple different touch points or exposures to different learning experiences. So I've got this slide up here, which is just a crude example of mapping outcomes for a training program that we have used in some of our training programs here in our office. So on the left, you'll see that we've got some of the learning outcomes outlined. And on the top row, you've got the various learning experience. So it could be a workshop, it could be a keynote speaker, it could be an experiential type opportunity. And this is just a crude example because it's simple yes or no. So you might have um, in workshop one, this person is learning a little bit about learning outcome one and learning experience B, yes, yes, and then you can kind of track it all the way through and mapping out the degree to which students are being exposed to various learning outcomes. You might see after mapping it that students are getting one of the learning outcomes a great deal and others not so much. So this is a great way to kind of do an assessment of a multi-component program to see where in which uh, students are getting exposed to various ideas and thoughts. You can take this an additional step further by looking at the degree to which students are getting into a particular learning outcome in a learning experience. So for example, um, a very basic um, example could be around active listening. So for example, learning outcome one um, in learning experience A, they might just be exposed to the idea or the value of it. Where in learning experience B, that could be a workshop where they're really kind of developing and practicing that skill. And perhaps learning experience C, um, they're kind of really getting a chance to practice and pick apart the skills of um, um, active listening. So you can take this to another level by kind of um, getting into the depth as well as the breadth of the various learning experiences. So I wanted to just give a few examples of how some of the tools and strategies that we're using um, in terms of learning outcomes assessment. But then I also wanted to kind of um, speak a little bit about the work that we're doing with our learning outcomes and assessment committee. So this has been formed, it has representation from all the units within the Division of Student Life here at St. George. And we have been focusing on three main areas. And the first one is around capacity. So as a committee, we've been working to try to identify and organize staff PD um, to help us build our confidence and 
competence with regards to assessment. Looking at the utility piece, so looking at discussing the results of divisional institutional projects and as well as a, an attempt to disseminate, share, and apply relevant data across the division. So I think we actually are quite good at collecting information, and I think um, informally we're great at taking that, processing, and applying it, but we're looking at trying to create um, a strategic way of doing that across the division. And then in strategies, looking at divisional key performance indicators and overall assessment strategies for the division, guide learning outcomes and assessment initiatives across the division as well. So um, this is what we've been working on in terms of our committee, but today I just wanted to focus a little bit about that top one there around capacity. So we came up with a bit of a five-point plan for how to build capacity across the division, um, and I'll just speak about these um, briefly, and then I'll talk a little bit about um, specifically our blog. So the first one is around a competency framework, which there are some that exist, and we borrowed very liberally um, from the ACPA ASK standards, which are the assessment skills and knowledge standards. Um, it's a competency framework that outlines all the different ways um, staff should be able to engage in activity efforts. So we took that um, and through our committee, um, reviewed it and designed it in such a way that it could be applicable for our particular context here. And that I think has been useful because with regards to assessment, some folks don't necessarily see themselves as experts and kind of want to know where they should be able to um, maneuver these activities so that they can feel confident to do so. So with the competency framework in mind, we developed a workshop series that is about 10 workshops that we're just starting to roll out this semester. Um, and each of the learning outcomes um, from the competency framework are mapped onto these workshops. So if you attend all of them, um, you would be see, uh, at one point exposed to each of the competencies in the framework. Um, on the other side, you could cherry pick which um, workshops you want to attend. So if you were using the assessment competency framework as a reflection tool, you might be able to see, okay, uh, one of them is a ability to design and utilize a rubric. And so you might want to find the workshop that is most relevant to that and attend that one because we have such a diversity of levels of experience across the division. Um, the last one, uh, the, sorry, item number three is our blog which has been kind of a central point of contact. We wanted to build up this idea of having a discussion around assessment, um, kind of sharing um, the different processes that people are engaged with in terms of what they're trying out in their different units. Um, and so the blog has been useful, and I'll um, speak a little bit more about that in the next slide. Peer review. So this is just a really great habit when we're talking about kind of any practice with regards to assessment. A lot of people are kind of at their desks, either developing their own learning outcomes or drawing from other kind of um, instruments in order to guide that. Um, but we really wanted to encourage the practice of sharing that and getting a second set of eyes. Um, so we're really trying to promote this idea of peer review, whether you're trying to design your assessment plan, you've got a survey instrument or uh, a focus group protocol that you want to work through. We're really trying to promote this idea and we've booked space and time on our campus that people can gather to have this, um, they can meet with members of the committee as well as other peers to kind of um, engage in that practice of peer review. And we're finding that people um, who have participated, have enjoyed it, um, have had a, um, enjoyed the opportunity to kind of articulate their goals and their strategies to someone else and kind of receive that honest feedback in order to enhance their practice. And the last one is around resource creation, and I think this is similar to what Kara was speaking about that, uh, with regards to that toolkit. And the one that um, has been kind of the most popular is our uh, toolkit around asking demographic questions. What we noticed is that many people across the division are asking lots and lots of demographic in, uh, questions, but aren't necessarily using it in a meaningful way or might be asking in a way that might not necessarily be appropriate um, or relevant. So we created this whole toolkit around asking demographic questions, one of them with a huge caveat around um, why um, thinking and really reflecting on why you might need to ask these questions. But, and so once you come to the decision that you need to, here are the best ways to ask them and how to kind of navigate that particular part of the assessment process. So um, the blog is called Measuring Up, and this was an existing blog um, from uh, the old uh, Division of Student Life. And I just wanted to show you what it looks like. And it's kind of um, been actually a little bit fun. We've got lots of different articles. You can see there that um, there's one around applying classroom assessment techniques to student life programming. We have one around ensuring accurate representation of student data. So that's trying to promote the whole idea of member checking. Um, but then we've also been engaging some students in the discussion. So we had a student write an, uh, a blog post around it was called To Complete or Not to Complete, a Student's Perspective on Taking Surveys. Um, great. Um, and then we had one called On a Scale of 1 to 5, How Much Do You Love Likert Scales? And then one around using infographics to share assessment results. So it's both a space for us to reflect on our practice as well as share some of the um, practices that we're engaging in that might be useful to other folks on the campus. 
So lastly, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, mention some of the resources that um, have been really useful. Um, and Kara did mention them, so I've just got the visuals here to support that. Um, we've got Learning Reconsidered and Learning Reconsidered 2, Assessment Reconsidered, as well as the Professional Standards for Higher Education, which comes from CAS, which is the short form for the Council for the Advancement of Standards in Higher Education. So um, a lot of really great resources out there, um, both online and through webinars and through lots of different sources, but these are some of the, I would say, formative documents that would be useful if you're exploring a learning assessment, uh, learning outcomes assessment on your campus. Oh, hi, um, this is Sonia. Um, I'm trying to advance my slide, if you'll bear with me for a second. There we go. So I'm t so excited not only to participate today, but I just want to get in a car, train, or whatever to visit Karen and Adam. They're doing such fabulous, exciting things. Um, I'm, I'm going to run through some of my slides that I think are less interesting because Kara and Adam did them better. Um, I want to let you know that my contact information um, not only is in this slide presentation, but it's also at the end. And um, I want to encourage you, if you would like to ask questions today and we don't get to them, or there's a conversation that we can have, please feel free to contact me afterwards. I also want to call your attention to the poll questions on the right-hand side. Yes, those are for you. They didn't uh, randomly, well, they look random, um, appear in our webinar today. We're going to get to some of those answers and why I want to talk about those questions and the answers um, later on. So at NYU, we make a distinction um, between student services and student engagement based on what co-curricular learning looks like here. So for this context where I'm working, um, student services has a tendency to be more transactional than student learning or co-curricular engagement or learning. Co-curricular, we try to make um, an intentional, thoughtful focus on student development and learning over time. And that's also, as you can see with the caveat, that these categories aren't mutually exclusive, but hopefully you get an idea um, between that transactional piece and that student learning piece and the distinctions that we make. So I want to talk about three things here today. Uh, one, assessment in the co-curricular, what is it? Two, how do we do it at NYU? But also three, why do we do it? And I recognize that it's, it's probably very insulting to all of you that I'm going to try to answer those questions in any sort of way in the next nine minutes. Um, so again, if, if you'd like to say, hey, I think that was messed up, or could we talk more about this, please get in touch afterwards. So the bottom line for me and for how we look at assessment at NYU is that it is a process of making explicit what we do. We make explicit what the purpose is and the impact we hope to have and why we do it. We want to support a culture of continuous improvement and quite frankly, we need a lot of data um, and a lot of attention to be able to do that well. So at the core, it's about communicating why we're here and why, if at all, what we do is important. This cycle of assessment emphasizes that assessment is a process and not necessarily an activity or an event um, in isolation, standing alone, um, maybe crying. But assessment as an activity obviously is part of the cycle of assessment. I think I have a little arrow on the screen and you can see down here um, where assessment as an activity fits into the process. So something else I'd like to call your attention to is how we organize looking at assessment in the co-curricular student affairs involves starting with the goals, the goals being the big chunks of what we want to accomplish and why, 
how students should be impacted by engaging with us, our programs, services, advising, and how we operationalize those goals are what we call outcomes. Those are the smaller bits that put into action specifically what would it look like to accomplish a goal. So a couple of notes on that. We also are um, some of my two biggest, um, I was going to say challenges, but they're really also opportunities and discussions, is one, being able to focus on what students experience and learn, not what staff do. So frequently an outcome might be phrased as increase programming by 25% for this particular population. Well, that's something that we might call a service goal and what the staff are expected to do, but doesn't really capture or communicate how students are supposed to be impacted by an event. The other focus or challenge I have is discussing the difference between and enacting the difference between direct and indirect evidence. So um, the direct evidence being preferable but more likely than not, we're collecting indirect evidence. And the difference there would be, if I asked you, what does HECO stand for? And you answered me, that would be a data point when we're collecting direct evidence. It's measuring what you know. Indirect, I would ask you, do you think you know what HECO stands for? So we want to uh, keep an eye out for that balance of direct and indirect, but we also want to err on the side of direct evidence. Again, um, uh, my portfolio looks similar to that of my peers here today. Um, this is something that I work with. The Division of Student Affairs has, um, how many units do I work with? Like 15 units in the Division of Student Affairs I also work with a couple of units outside the Division of Student Affairs at NYU. And these are some of the activities. This is how um, I'm doing the work here at NYU. And I say, I'm, you'll, you'll notice that I, I sometimes say the office or we, um, and I realize that that's not probably very healthy or accurate. I'm an office of one. So I guess I'm also then speaking about myself in the third person, which is kind of weird. So, but it also felt very strange to say, I do this and I do everything because obviously there are tons of collaborations, um, just like my other colleagues, and we really can't do good assessment or we can't do assessment well without collaborating. Um, but my office at NYU, uh, the Office of Research and Assessment is just me. These are some of the things I do. Uh, the assessment plans and audits uh, mirror some of the inventories that Kara was talking about earlier. Um, I'm also tasked with addressing individual unit as well as division projects. And what I mean by unit are some of those functional areas. We have a Center for Multicultural Education and Programs, LGBTQ Student Center. We have an Office of Interactive Media, Residence Life and Housing. Those are some of the examples. But I'm happy to talk with you about this context um, offline if you want to determine how helpful um, what we do here might be for your context. So now we get into some of the why is this important. And it's important because we are in a unique position in working with students and co-curricular learning we're in a unique position not only to be partners with the students in their learning, but also faculty and staff around the college and university. We're in this position to provide information that rounds out that picture of how are students experiencing your institution. And in order to be able to do that, we need a complement of data. Students are spending a majority of their time outside the classroom, and that in order to develop some of those accurate models of students' experiences as well as um, predict metrics, we have to do a better job of correct collecting that co-curricular data. I'm going to provide a couple of the examples really quickly, again, of the how we're doing um, assessment work at NYU. This first one is what I was calling a quick cut. I'm a big fan of short and small. 
So this is an actual index card um, that has two sides. One, a student is writing um, what religious literacy means to them, and they're defining it. On the other side, they're providing some uh, demographic information. And we do this um, to gather data that is not program specific, but rather it's still aligned with those learning outcomes that are operationalizing the unit's goal. In this case, uh, the unit's uh, global spiritual life. In the Division of Student Affairs at NYU, we do not have division-wide goals. So some of this is all very unit specific. Another um, short pre-post, Adam was um, alluding to it earlier, and also the challenge of that direct versus indirect evidence. Uh, do you think uh, the campus is inclusive and before and after the intervention in between might create that awareness to be more critical than they might have been um, at the beginning of the intervention? In a, a different approach to addressing that is that we focus on collecting direct evidence. So in a pre and post safe zone quiz, we ask students to define terminology they have a question to write on, and they also identify resources. And we can do that before and after in order to assess some of what happened as a result of the intervention. Part of how we're doing um, assessment also is I, maybe it's because I'm an office of one, but I try to maximize impact that any assessment activity can have. So this is one way of making assessment in the co-curricular organizationally valuable. So I'm suggesting that we center any organizational, or excuse me, any assessment focus in the center here of where pressing issues in the co-curricular intersect with learning outcomes and high impact educational practices. And that is part of how we spend some time on some of the important skills for graduates that employers have talked about. So we consider the extent to which life in the co-curricular, we are very much concerned with these as outcomes and learning opportunities. Um, I can't see if you all have answered the poll. If you haven't, could you do that now? We're gonna close it in a second. Now, that's all to say that um, some of my criticism of my field is that we are unduly attached to procedures and methods, and we don't really talk about some of the characteristics of assessment as a political and social action and activity. We need to be more mindful, in my opinion, of some of the influences, some of the context, and much more critical about what has meaning and value. So towards that end, I wanted to chat briefly about our poll results. Which of these shows do, do you, did you watch with the most frequency? None of the above. Now, I wanted to use this as an example to consider how might we apply a critical framework to what we do. We have to look at describing versus interpreting versus evaluating. Um, and part of the, I wanted to do that with these two TV show questions. So here's what these results tell me. Um, so we have 59% of the respondents said, I didn't watch any of those shows most frequently. So first of all, um, that w what we can say about that is that the question was probably written poorly. We also need to consider the assumptions that we're going into not only constructing the question, but also the um, options. So part of it, for example, with these TV questions, we might be assuming people have access to a TV. If they have access to a TV, they have access to these networks. Is that an assumption we're making? Are we making assumptions of people's age um, as well as location with the offerings of these particular TV shows? Um, 
and what we can say about not only this item, this first item of frequency, is very little. We would just be able to say the frequency with which someone watched a show, we wouldn't be able to comment like the second item might consider, which show was your favorite? It looks like I have some Flashpoint fans out there. That's exciting. So when we go to the next step of being able to interpret um, responses to, in this case, uh, quantitatively approached items, we can still say of respondents, this is what was the favorite. What we can't say is, we can't say anything about the respondents. We can't say anything about the time period. This does not account for the difference in runtime of any shows. It also doesn't account for, hey, Sonia, why did you ask us this? How is this information going to be used? So to be able to do work that gets to um, the target, if you will, if I could use Adam's um, metaphor there, and if we want to maximize the chance of hitting our target, we might want to consider all sorts of things about the story that Adam told us. We want to consider the size of the target, the distance we are from the target, the skill of the archer, the type of material or equipment the archer is using. The same is true for how we're conducting assessment, what we're prioritizing, and why. Because ultimately, we want to get to what type of meaning can be inferred. So what type of meaning can we infer from question two of what the, was the favorite TV show? One, someone who is not from Canada has probably done a pretty poor job in picking Canadian TV shows. That's one of the things I might consider a high inference interpretation. Or some of my favorite TV shows, Sonia's, are not the same as anyone else's favorite TV shows. What can it say about an individual that has um, a greater reliability because I get to tell you my truth and talk about how it relates to me as an individual? As a group, what can we say about this? Well, unless we've considered those assumptions and framing points, what are the assumptions that go into how we focus assessment? What do we ask? How do we ask it? What do we gather? Ultimately, to be able to say, what does it mean? We want to be able to improve how we evaluate or explain. That's the basis of a critical approach. Because there is a tipping point where a lack of specificity or high levels of inference render our data useless. So putting that all together, I'm suggesting today that engaging assessment as a social and political practice requires us to pay a lot of attention of who is represented, why, how, and when. Who is deciding what is worthy of assessment attention? Because assessment in an indirect way is prioritizing learning over other learning. So who uh, benefits and why? And so that I suggest for best practices in assessment that we privilege and prioritize experiences of the underrepresented and underserved, but that I would also encourage you not only to contribute actively to your professional spheres, but also um, to cross some of those boundaries in order to collaborate. I have a couple of suggestions of how you could do that. You will have access to the slides at the end of the presentation. So if these links don't work or you have a hard time finding um, the information that I'm talking about, please feel free to reach out. I'm just going to say a word about student affairs assessment leaders. Um, I'm a member and I'm on the board of this organization. Part of our professional development activities include monthly structured conversations. There are webinars um, where you can probably get involved um, just simply because of the number of people. So check out a structured conversation.
Thank you, Kara, Adam, and Sonia for your engaging and informative presentations. So we now have a few minutes left um, for some questions from the audience. So if you have um, any questions right now, you can also send them to us um, via the Q&A panel. So our first question is from Bob. Have you done any collaborative work with academic units on their learning outcomes, including how activities associated with your unit support the academic unit's learning outcomes? So we're going to go to Kara and then Adam and Sonia. So Kara, do you have any comments on this? Um, just that that's work that we are just beginning to do. So we've had a few academic units who are also looking at the co-curricular work in relation to the students in their program. And so they're engaging us in some of those uh, conversations. Uh, but they're early conversations at this point, so I don't have a lot to share um, on what that exactly looks like. Um, but maybe somebody else does, so I'll pass it along. Adam? Alexander, can you repeat the question, please? Yeah, sure. Have you done any collaborative work with academic units on their learning outcomes, including how activities associated with your unit support the academic unit's learning outcomes? Great. So that is a great question, and I would um, also echo Kara's observation. That's something that we're kind of in the early stages of. One of the things that has proven quite useful in this regard is our co-curricular record competency framework, which we have developed um, based on the CAS standards. And so our co-curricular record is essentially an activities um, document that records um, validated participation in campus-related activities and co-curricular engagement. And with that, we have a competency framework that has kind of broad, um, broadly named competencies like um, teamwork, communication, systems thinking. Um, and what that has allowed um, is for us to look at all the activities that go on to the co-curricular record and map those onto the competencies. So with um, academic departments, um, when they're looking at some of their activities that do support their academic mission, they're all, we're able to speak a shared language and we're able to kind of map who's doing what. And so the overall process of developing the co-curricular record has really advanced our ability to kind of look at that and relate to one another in that regard. Sonia, have you done any collaborative work with academic units on their learning outcomes? No, we have not. Some of that problem is because of um, the size and complexity of New York University as an institution. Part of it is because um, academic assessment activities are very separated um, organizationally from uh, student affairs. And part of it is because um, our academic assessment peers at NYU have come to the assessment party a lot later. Um, than our, my co-curricular colleagues. And so we have not collaborated particularly on identifying learning outcomes. Thank you. So our next question, if somebody came to you looking for advice on how to get started on an assessment project, what advice would you give them? So maybe we'll hear from Adam first, then go to Kara, and then Sonia. Great. Um, one of the questions, and this happens quite a bit, um, especially with our peer-to-peer -peer consultations, people are at all different steps and places with regards to their assessment activities, is one of them is um, we just ask overall, what are your goals? What difference do you want to make in the lives of students? Um, what impact do you want to have? What skills do you want them to have as a result of participating in your activity? Or what knowledge or awareness or increased appreciation do you want them to have? So just kind of thinking broadly and then kind of zooming in from there around specific outcomes. Um, we think about looking at, there's lots of different ways to achieve an outcome, so in order to kind of even start thinking about your, your particular program or your, or your how, you have to look at the what's as well and what specific goals you have. Um, and that's where the conversations typically start. Kara, do you have any advice on how to get started on an assessment project? Um, I think there are small groups of people doing the work at many of our institutions. Um, and I think it's important to look around your campus and also your networks off your campus for colleagues um, who might be able to, will, like, willing to act as a resource if you're starting sort of um, and you don't know what's out there. Because I think there are a number of knowledgeable people and really exciting initiatives, but it's not necessarily something that is very visible to everyone. Um, 
And I just, I found that it's been really helpful to reach out to some of those people and, and people have been really generous in sharing their knowledge. Um, I think there is a strong interest in this area right now. So people seem really excited to share their knowledge and their experience. And um, I think it's really helpful so that you don't feel sort of isolated and alone and you can get a few different perspectives because sometimes the things that work on one campus don't always work on other campuses. So you can also get that sort of multi-campus perspective if you reach out both within your campus and outside of your campus. Sonia, do you have any advice for people starting out on assessment projects? I underscore uh, both what Adam and Kara have offered, and I don't think I can contribute any better. <laughs> All right, thank you. So unfortunately, we've run out of time, but I would like to thank Kara, Adam, and Sonia for joining us today. If you have any questions for our presenters, feel free to contact them using the information on the screen. If you are interested in learning more about HECO and would like to join our mailing list, you can go to our website at www.heco.ca and enter your contact information on the bottom right corner of this page. Um, this webinar will be posted on our website probably in a day or two with the slides. Um, so you can go and find it there. And for any of your colleagues that weren't able to join us, um, they can also find it there. So when you leave the webinar, we ask that you take a moment to complete the survey. Um, we'd like to hear about your experiences so we can improve our webinars. We also would like to welcome ideas for future webinars. So thank you again to our presenters, and I hope you all have a wonderful day.